This is Democracy Now! As we look at this crisis of climate, class and race coming together, one of the poorest states in this country, a city that's over 80 percent African American, Jackson, Mississippi. More than 180,000 residents are on their third day without running water. We're talking about water to drink. We're talking about water to flush the toilet. We're talking water to bathe in. Officials say the crisis could last indefinitely. For more, we're joined by Kali Akuno, longtime activist, co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson, an organization that works to democratize the economy and empower the black community. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Kali. Um, <clears throat> if you can elaborate on what the mayor has just shared with us, the description of what's happening on the ground and how people are coming together on the ground. You had a resident that we just mm -hmm. played before we spoke to the mayor saying that the state is defunding majority black cities and mayors. Well, first, uh, it's a pleasure to be back, uh, Amy. Um, let me describe a little bit of where uh, I am. I'm currently uh, in New Orleans. Um, when uh, the mayor issued um, the warning on Saturday for folks to evacuate. Um, we took the situation very seriously uh, and started organizing on a regional level uh, our allies uh, to start being able to deliver water to the city of Jackson. Uh, as the mayor noted, you know, uh, we are not new to this uh, situation, unfortunately. Uh, so we could anticipate uh, that we were going to need some resources, uh, independent of what the state was going to be able to offer uh, and deliver, uh, and in our case, not being in, at least in our immediate community, not being reliant on uh, the timeline, particularly of the state government, to deliver vital resources to our community. Uh, too often, uh, they've declared, you know, emergencies and then not delivered or not delivered in a substantial amount of time to actually help people on the ground. Uh, so, our organization, along with several of our allies throughout the Gulf Coast, started mobilizing over the weekend to start gathering up resources to be able to deliver to the people of Jackson uh, in their time of need. Uh, and it is it is a little bit worse than what I think what we anticipated. Uh, we've been under these boil water notices, I think, as the mayor noted, uh, for months. Uh, we've been under many of these on a constant level for years. So there's been a level of awareness and preparation that many people uh, in Jackson, uh, you know, have been attuned to for some time. Uh, but now that we've kind of reached this acute phase of, of system failure, um, we are going to be a bit overwhelmed. Uh, and I think the the commentator that you had just talking about the situation, uh, you know, being untenable, that is really what it's going to, to be like, I think, for many in our city for weeks to come. And, Kali, I wanted to ask you, uh, but this infrastructure issue and the racial inequities, it, uh, un, un, it reveals across the country. Several years ago, we had the situation in Flint. Uh, subsequent to that, there was the crisis in Newark's public schools uh, with infrastructure, mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. lead pipes in the water. And now we're looking at Jackson. All of these cities are majority black cities. Uh, could you... Could you talk about this situation of the inequities that occur in our system right. when it comes even to infrastructure? Well, number one, it's not by, by happenstance or coincidence. Uh, what we are experiencing now is, is literally just the crumbling of the empire's infrastructure. I think everybody needs to be clear about that. And that this has a long history, I think, as the mayor and other commentators have noted. Um, if you really want to trace a lot of this back, it goes back to, uh, I would argue, to the 1950s and 60s uh, with the so-called urban renewal uh, programs and the massive subsidization of the suburbs, which facilitated white flight uh, out of many of these major cities, Jackson being one of them, uh, and with that uh, went major capital flight. Uh, and that has continued uh, with very chronic programs of divestment and, and uh, deindustrialization, in many cases in most of the cities like Jackson, uh, which is just left crumbling in infrastructure. In every city that you you mentioned, Newark, Flint, Detroit, uh, we can go on. Uh, this story, this development, which was facilitated 
you know, by programs which are developed on a national level uh, right after World War II is what brings us to this uh, uh, dimension of the crisis. We also have to talk about, you know, being honest and, and, and really linking this to the deeper issue of, of climate change uh, and the, the threat that is, it is clearly now posing all over the world. I mean, uh, just listening to your introduction, we're, we're talking about uh, droughts, you know, uh, in, in East Africa. We're talking about record flooding uh, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, we have severe drought going on in, in uh, Western Europe right now in the Western portion of the United States. We have to look at this. I would encourage, you know, the audience to look at all of these dynamics uh, uh, as a whole. And Jackson is just, just one of these kind of acute areas with this systemic policy around uh, uh, just totally subsidizing the petrochemical industry, you know, for, for decades now, almost a century, but particularly the United States for 50 years, is the other part of what has been driving this particular crisis, creating all of this uh, systemic change. And, and if we look at, you know, what's being proposed on the broader level, on the one hand, you have uh, the federal government pushing for more drilling, pushing for more, you know, kind of false solutions, as we would say, uh, in the climate justice movement, uh, but but have this aggravated uh, uh, infrastructure crisis uh, everywhere, which is not adequately being addressed, in part uh, because of the politics uh, and where the Republicans are at or, or being insistent on denying climate change uh, and being insistent on more privatized solutions. But, you know, on the other hand, uh, you know, what a, a lot of the Democrats uh, and the liberals are proposing are also a set of false solutions which are based upon kind of these market dynamics, which really don't work and just continue to aggravate the inequities and the inequalities that we are facing in a, in a city like Jackson. And, Colleen, we only have about 30 seconds left, but there have been attempts in the past to privatize the water supply in Jackson. Could you mm -hmm. talk about that? Well, my fear, uh, uh, you know, the, the mayor talked about this coalition and uh, I also applaud that, that finally the governor has kind of come to his senses uh, and is offering some uh, some support. Uh, but we need to be mindful of, of what they're offering, uh, I would argue, from the social movement perspective. Uh, and this effort to kind of pay for uh, half of the, the, the cost of one of the facilities, Jackson has two, of one of the facilities, while it, it will help, it's kind of just putting a Band-Aid on the situation. And I have a fear, uh, which I think many people in our community share, that the offer of aid is a prelude to a larger conversation of how do you fix the situation, and their offering is going to be to either privatize it, because they're going to make an argument that Jackson does not have the capacity or capability to manage its own affairs, which is totally false, or they're going to try to regionalize it which is the other option of, of kind of a threat of divesting Jackson of its critical resources and autonomies uh, that has been on the table for many a year. Kali Akuna, we want to thank you for being with us, co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson. Of course, we'll continue to follow this uh, climate, class and race catastrophe that has converged in Jackson, uh, Mississippi, where the population no longer has access to clean drinking water, to water, to flush the toilet, to bathe, to use at all.